Uh, say Matthew chapter number five. When you have it, say amen. Amen. And if you have your booklet with you, your handout, uh, say amen. We do want to remember uh, Sister Roper. Her sister passed away this week. Uh, and also Deacon Bass, his brother, uh, passed away last week. His funeral is on Friday. I'm waiting for information on Sister Roper. Uh, sister, uh, we are going to certainly be praying for those families. Uh, so certainly keep them up before the Lord, if you will, in your prayers. Amen. amen. All right. Uh, when you have it, say amen. All right. St. Matthew chapter number five is a, is a, uh, uh, is really a profound and a uh, truly foundational and uh, life-changing text. Just those first 12 verses are life-changing if we adopt them, uh, if we wrap ourselves around them. Amen. Uh, we have covered uh, these Beatitudes because uh, these were things that Jesus wanted uh, his disciples and his followers to exemplify. Uh, I don't know about you, uh, but how many of y'all are tired of people who say they're something, but they're really not? Amen. Uh, aren't you tired of people just telling you they love you? They really don't love you because if they loved you, they wouldn't treat you the way they treat you. Uh, are you tired of people telling you that they're Christian, but they, they really, uh, they, 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 they don't act like a Christian, and then it makes everybody look bad. It just makes, and, and I'm talking about you, but I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about you. Uh, uh, and and I'm, I'm, being, I'm being for real, because uh, the reality is, is that we like to show ourselves sometimes what we're, what we're not, instead of being very real, uh, because you cannot grow. And, and I mean this. You cannot grow or become better if you don't deal with what's going on. You will never become a good cook until you understand the mistakes that you made the last time. Amen? Uh, 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 the one thing I, I, I love to do, I, I like to barbecue, and I like to take my time, right? I like to take my time. Uh, and uh, I cooked one time so fast, I hated it. I hated the food that I cooked, and everybody thought it was so good. I said, no, it wasn't. Because it was, I cooked it too fast. But th they seemed to like it. It was cooked through. I didn't think it was as tender as it should have been. Uh, and so I got a little frustrated with myself. Amen. But I've learned over time that you must accept those moments of, de of, of I'm not going to say defeat, moments of setback. And correct what you did wrong so that you can do what's right to get better. Can you say Amen. All right, so watch what he says uh, as Jesus is talking to them as his Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes. As he talked about the poor in spirit, those that mourn, those that are meek, uh, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. And I, and, and I really want you to understand that that sixth verse is really the foundation of becoming the first, the second, or the third, the fourth, and the fifth verse. The sixth verse is critical. The sixth verse is critical to becoming a true Christian. To become truly Christ-like, that sixth verse is critical. There must be hunger and there must be a thirst for righteousness. Amen? There has to be. There has to be a hunger. Because if there is no hunger, then there can never be a merciful spirit. There can never be a merciful soul. There can never be a person of mercy. If you don't hunger and thirst after God, you can never know what God, who, what God really can do and how God really cares without that. Then it talks about verse number 8, and I think that's where we want to start tonight. And when we get to verse number 8, he said, Blessed are the what? Pure in heart, for they what? It is important for us to understand that the purity of the heart uh, uh, can only be required or acquired through a continual cleansing that a believer experiences. I want someone to go to Romans chapter number 12. Let's go to Romans chapter number 12 and let's look at this. How does a cleaning, cleansing take place?
When you have it, say amen. Now, a pure heart can only be acquired through the continuous cleansing that a believer experiences when they have fulfilled the precious conditions of blessedness. Now, here's some of the conditions that we have to fulfill. Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies, what? A living sacrifice. Now, he doesn't ask you to be something that you uh, are not capable of being. He doesn't ask you to reach higher than you can. He doesn't ask you to stoop down lower than you, lower than you, are, than you are willing or able to go. He asks you to present your bodies a living sacrifice. And in that sacrifice, he asks us to do some things. First, it must be holy. A sacrifice cannot be holy until God has sanctified it and made it holy. Now, all of us that have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, have been filled with his spirit, have been made holy. And to be holy means to be set apart. It means to have the character of God. You cannot offer your life as a sacrifice with your own character. God will not accept it. Not going to accept your attitude or your self-righteousness. It has to be holy. I want you to think about that. Somebody gives you a gift and they said, here, this is what you wanted. I don't know about you, but I would tell them, keep it. Come on here, talk to me. You take that mess back, you're going to give it to me like that. That's what some people feel like they can bring their life to God, Sister Price, Sister Jones. They feel like they can bring God, their life any kind of way. But that life must be, watch this, it must be a sacrificial life. Which means you must be willing. Something that is sacrificed is done willfully. It is not coerced. It is not made to fear. It is given with every fiber of the being freely. You don't have to push them. It's freely given. It is holy. It is acceptable. Unto God. Now, what the word acceptable means, it meets all of the expectation. I don't know about you, but if you want somebody to bake you a uh, straw, if you want somebody to bake you a, uh, uh, what's them, what, them red velvet cakes? Y'all like, you like red velvet cake. What about caramel cake? Caramel cake? Yeah. You want somebody to bake you a caramel cake, and they bake you a caramel cake, and they got, they take the caramel and pull all the caramel on top of the cake. You're like, there ain't no caramel cake, man. What you doing? You know, you just pull caramel on top of the cake. That, 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 come on, right? True caramel cake got to have caramel everywhere, right? My grandmama used to make upside down cake, a pineapple upside down cake. Anybody know, they don't make them no more, do they? I don't know. She make them things, and so she make pineapple upside. You, you didn't want that, and then the old folks would make coconut cake, which young folks don't know how to make. Who who, uh, who who feels like they, they know what they're doing, uh, make you a cake. You're like, hold on just a second. How you like it? Well, it's not as moist. Well, I read the recipe. Well, how many cups of, uh, how, much, how many teaspoons of oil did you put in? I ain't putting no oil in it. Okay. You still like it, don't you? Well, no, because you didn't make it to the recipe or to the expectation. Come on. Are you with me? So God is not going to, to accept, watch this, God cannot accept something that does not meet his standard. It would make, it, it, it would make God out to be, hmm, it, it, it would make God out to be somebody that accepts whatever, whatever. The devil will take whatever. God expects something that meets his standard. And watch this. The great thing about what God does, he gives you the power to meet the expectation. He don't just tell you you need to meet this expectation. He gives you power so you can meet the expectation. Am I right? All right. So watch watch what he says next. He says this. Acceptable unto God, which is your what? 
I want you to circle the word reasonable. That word reasonable means that's what you're supposed to do. Coming to serve God and giving him praise. You ain't got to walk out here with your head all up talking about, ooh, I really gave the Lord praise. No, you did what you were supposed to do. Everybody ought to enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Because he said, if you don't praise me, what? The rocks will cry out. He said, he said y'all, y'all want, talking about y'all the, the, the sons of Abraham. I can take these rocks and raise up seed to Abraham. He wants you to know, and I want y'all, everybody in here to know, we have done nothing spectacular when we have come, in, come into this sanctuary and worship God like he wants to be worshiped. Give God the glory like he wants to. We have done nothing but what we have been expected to do. So don't walk out of here with your chest stuck out as if like you did something special. The service was high because you met the expectation. <laughs> come on. Just imagine, everybody would come in on a Sunday and say, we come here to give God the glory. Just imagine what the service would be. So this Sunday, when everybody come in here, leave all your problems in your car, come in here and give God the glory. Leave everything else out. Because the Bible says he dwelled in the midst of. So when there's praise that is true and that is willful, that is joyfully given, God sweeps through the house. Transforms lives. Verse chapter verse number two, chapter twelve says, "Be not conformed to this world." Here's where he begins to lay it out. He said, "But be ye transformed by the renewing of your what mind, by the renewing of your mind." If I'm going, if I'm going to have a pure heart, there must be a renewing of my mind daily. I cannot carry the grudges of yesterday into today. I cannot carry the hurt of yesterday into today. I cannot carry the rejection of today into today, of yesterday into today. Think about it. All of us have been hurt. Raise your hand. It stings. It, it, it makes you want to throw your hands up and holler. Makes you want to just quit. But how many of you know... If we work through it and we allow our minds to adjust to our new way of living and adjust to the new who, the new us, without what we had, whether it was rejection or hurt, over time you get better. Am I right? So as I'm getting better, then I ought to let that go so that God can get the glory. Why am I growing carrying the same stuff on my back that I should have let go? Is, my, is, is all that labor and all of that crying and all of that working through it in vain if I'm still carrying the burden and the pain and the grudge and the agony from it? Isn't the victory, it, isn't the victory in the fact that I've been able to let it go? Are you with me? That's where the victory comes in. So in transforming of my mind, there will be victory. There will be a victory as I I look at myself and realize that I am better than he says, better than she said, better than what they thought. Because as I'm being transformed in my mind, guess what happens? I'm proving what is the good, the acceptable, and perfect will of God. My Lord. Isn't that something that my life, as I overcome, as I go through, I prove to the world and to everybody around what is that good, that acceptable, and the perfect will of God. Let me tell you something. Nobody wants to be in God's permissive will. Everybody wants to be in his perfect and divine will. You want to be in the divine will of God. You want to be in the perfect will of God. You want to be able to to move so God can get the glory. Move in the spirit of God. Amen. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that that is among you, not to think of himself what? More highly than he ought to what? But to think how? Soberly. How? Soberly, but how? 
according, in accordance to what? As God has dealt to every man, what? The measure of faith. In other words, you don't have to be greater than the person next to you. Just live at the level of faith that God has given you. Watch this. We need to understand that, the, that, the, that our faith that we have in God is all we need to go to the next level. I don't need to be like anybody but me. And if I learn to trust God the way I get to know God, my faith will grow. Are you listening? Everybody in here is a different learner. Everybody in here operates differently, come from different backgrounds. How you get to know God in your personal walk is going to be different from the person sitting next to you. Because you are not wired like them. God has to deal with you according to the measure of faith that you have. The vet like to laugh. That's because she's anointed and she gets it. Everybody else like, why is she laughing? Because she gets it. And some of us get it and we say, thank God. Some of us get it and we'll run around the church. Because everybody's a different learner and when they get it, the response is different. And it doesn't mean that somebody doesn't get it because they, they get it because they're trying to piece it with every other piece of that puzzle. Are you with me? Let's go back. Let's go back. Go back. Let's go back. So then he says, blessed, blessed are the pure in heart because as I'm transformed and as we are transformed to that condition of blessedness, that satisfaction through the transformation of our mind. It doesn't matter what goes on. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It doesn't matter how we feel. God is still our keeper. God is still our helper. He's still our friend. He's still our bridge over troubled water. Amen. So in the blessedness, watch this. The purer we become, the more clearly we can see God. In other words, the more we allow the word of God to transform us, the more we become conformed, transformed by God and less conformed to the world, the more we begin to see God more clearer. Mm hmm. Yes. See, see, look, I got these glasses on. Right. But I got another pair of glasses in my bag. Right. And, and, and either this this week, I found out either my my eyes are, are not as good as they, they were in these glasses because because everything is not as clear as it used to be. But I put on the other glasses, everything just is crystal clear. Now, watch this. In the test you're going through right now, things may not look as clear as you would like for them to. But keep living. Keep walking with God. The next day or the day after you get up, you're going to say, oh, I see now why I'm where I'm at. I see now why God is working with me like he's working with me. I think this morning, uh, 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 yeah, this morning we were dealing with Jesus in the wilderness, I think, what was our reading this morning. But the other morning, I talked about how the sacrifice that Jesus made was for folk that were valuable. His life was priceless, but you were worth his life. Y'all not hearing me. You were worth his life. Y'all, my God. See, see, we walk around here talking about that we're not worthy. Honey, Jesus died. Had to make you, you have to be worth more than what you think for somebody to give their life for you. That means you are valuable and that makes their life valuable. So Jesus not going to die for something that's not valuable and neither will you give up anything for something that's not valuable. And so therefore, watch what he says and, 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 and watch this because he says those that have a pure heart. Pure heart. You're not going to transform to have a pure heart unless you know that seeing God is valuable to you. So here we go. So when we talk about uh, uh, seeing God more clearly, this is a place that I like to call, and I wrote this, this is the place uh, where holiness and happiness are fully described and put together. When I see God, that's when my holiness 
and my happiness or my satisfaction are fully met. When I can see God in my life, in my space, working for me, I'm satisfied. Y'all don't hear me. Is there anybody in here that see God working right now? You realize that wherever, everything that has been going on, God has been there with you. God has helped you to get where you are. There ought to be a satisfaction even though you may not be in a place where you used to be, but you're in a place where God is doing the work. This, this place, when we get to this pureness of heart, it is a place where an inter, inward transformation takes place uh, where, where we become true Christians. Uh, I talked a little bit about this last week. We become true Christians. Everybody a Christian, but true Christians are the same every day. It doesn't matter what somebody says or what goes on. You're not moving. You're not quitting. You're not giving up. True Christianity is like this. True Christianity cannot operate out of a, out of a conflicting lifestyle. If I'm a true Christian, I ain't going to be hanging out when I'm frustrated. Go buy me a fifth and sit down and cry. I don't, no, no, that, that, that. True Christianity can't operate out of a conflicting lifestyle. It's not going to happen. What do you mean? But, but, but you, you got to understand, sometimes folk get stressed. Baby, let me have the Bible says, be anxious for nothing, but in all things with prayer and supplication, make your request known unto the Lord. Uh, am, I, am I in the right church? I say, well, Pastor, you just don't understand. Folk treat you bad. The Bible, the Bible's, and, and, and you know, sometimes you just got to go off. No, the Bible says, uh, uh, the Bible tells us that we ought to pray for them that despitefully use us and say all manner falsely against us. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. But I say, well, I can't make it. I just can't make it. I can't make it. The Bible says, yes, you can. The Bible says you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You have to be able to operate in that true Christianity. How do I get there, Pastor? I got to allow myself to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. I cannot allow my mind to become a victim to what I do not have. But my mind must be focused on everything that God has promised. I want you to look at uh, uh, this morning when 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 uh, in the reading uh, we talked about earlier just a few minutes ago when 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 the Satan came to Jesus after being in the wilderness and he tempted him he tempted him with what he saw what he felt and who he was he said if you be the son of God that's the pride of life if you the son of God you ought to act like it you ought to you ought to do something cast yourself down because you know the angels are gonna come get you. Hold on just a second. I ain't got to prove to you that I'm a true Christian. I ain't got to do no antics. I ain't got to do stuff just to prove to you. Why? Because I know who I am. One of the key components to a pure heart is knowing who you are in God. Because watch this. If I don't know who I am, I'm in a place that is not comfortable. Somebody, let's go to James. Let me show you what I mean. Let me show you what I mean. Let's go to James. James chapter 1. When you get to James chapter 1, say amen. All right. James right into those uh, 12 tribes that were scattered. And, and, and I want you to pay close attention to the word scattered. Because when something is scattered, that means there's a lot of what? When it's scattered, what is it? You said it. You said it. Said Perry, what, what is it? When it's something that's scattered all over the place, what is it? What does that mean? There you go. Confusion. Chaos. Something ain't together. And watch this. When people are scattered everywhere, there's a whole lot of stuff going on. A lot of fear, a lot of fright. So here's what James tells them. He said, my brother, count it all joy 
when you fall into divers temptation. That requires, let me tell you something, that requires somebody who, who, who really stable in God. Uh, yeah, because I'm going to tell you, a lot of us don't count it joy when we hit it. Yeah, why? We first thing want to say, how can hurt him get out of this thing? Let me hurt him get out of here. James say, count it all joy. What? Yeah, man, you ought to get excited when you get hit across the face with a, with, with a, with a, uh, a spade. Just hit you in the square between us. You ought to just shout hallelujah. James, that don't make no sense. He said, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, knowing that the trying of your faith, what? Be, be renewing of your mind, uh, that you may prove that which is good and acceptable will of God. So, so, so if getting slapped in the face with a spade proves the perfect and acceptable will of God, then I ought to count it all joy. <laughs> Why? Because all things work together for the good. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't getting slapped in the face and, and counted all joy and proven the good will of the perfect will of God and 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 it, it works for my good. You telling me getting slapped in the face works? Watch, let me show you what I mean. Watch this. Why? But let what? Knowing that this, the trying of your faith, it worketh patience. It worketh character. Somebody say character. It works character. Hopefully I can quote this right. Martin Luther King said, education does not uh, develop, uh, oh, I, I forgot how it says, Martin Luther King stated that education was not designed to just to create people who are intelligent, but it's designed to create character. I'm just paraphrasing. It's designed to create character. It doesn't, make you, set you apart or make you something better, it establishes character. The more you learn, the more you ought to see the, 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 the sad or all the problems around and you ought to want to try to fix some of them. You get a lot of money, you, ought, you, you, you shouldn't want to hoard or buy a whole lot of stuff. You ought to see where you can impact lives. So education ought to be something that allows us to see how we can impact lives. I'm just paraphrasing it. I'll get the correct quote. So when we see this, faith worketh patience. The trying of our faith works character. A lot of us, when we are in a test, how many of us immediately get upset? When things are not going the way we think they ought to go in the test. Or if you've ever been in a test and it didn't go your way and you got upset. How many of us ever been there? Raise your hand. The moment we realize that if we just slow down, character was being created and formed in us. Why? Why? He says, so but let patience have what? Her perfect work. Patience knows how to create, character knows how to make you better. Tests and trials know how to make you better, to create character. That you may be perfect, entire. Look at that last, that, that, those last two words. What does it say? James chapter number, chapter number one and verse number four. That you may be perfect and entire Say that again. You are satisfied with what you're becoming. You're not trying to be like anybody. Am I, am, I, am I still in the same vein? You're not trying to be like anybody else. I'm just glad being who I am. I'm glad with the gifts that I got. I ain't trying to get yours. I'm glad working in the, in the area I'm working in. I ain't trying to move you out. In fact, I'm trying to hide. Come on. I'm just trying to hide. He says, watch this. But he says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. That give it to all men liberally and abrade it not. And it shall be what? Given. Now, if you lack wisdom... 
if you lack the ability to uh, uh, wisdom to properly uh, direct your character and to control yourself, ask of God. Because the Bible says you ought to know how to possess your vessels in sanctification and honor. That's wisdom. So if you don't know how to do that, you need wisdom. But watch this. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavers is like a wave of the sea driven by the winds and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. And the reality is, as many of us are asking God for something, but we're always moving from one place to another. We ask God for this, then we ask God for something else the next day. Then we go back and say, well, Lord, if, 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 I want you to do that, but can you do this too? Can you do? No, what do you want from God? Stop going to God with 15 different things and ask God for what you need. Wisdom, so you know how to pray. Wisdom, so you know how to ask God for what he needs. Wisdom, so you can say, Lord, give me the strength to get through this test and this temptation. Because that's what I need more than all this other stuff that I'm asking for. Why? Why do I need to be more stable? Look at verse number 8. Why? Read verse number 8. Stop right there. A double-minded man is unstable. Now remember what I said. I said this inward transformation moves us to to, to become true Christians. And true Christians cannot live a conflicting life. That's why double-minded folk don't last long trying to live for God. They're going to always find a reason not to come to church. They're going to always find a reason why they can't pray. They're going to always find a reason why they just can't get it together. Just tap yourself on the chest. Say, come on, get it together. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You got that quote? That's it. Intelligence plus character is the goal of true education. Too many of us are not asking God or not being educated by God so that we can have True spiritual intellect. And I'm going to get to that here in just a second. All right? But let's deal with this double-minded man is unstable in some of his ways. A few of his ways. All of them. Relational, he's unstable. Financial, unstable. Emotional, unstable. Mental, unstable. Psychological, unstable. Physiological, unstable unstable they do stuff like who I'm trying to lose weight but they got three plates in front of me well something's wrong I ain't getting no I'm being for real I got high blood pressure but you still eating them pig feet you need to do something if you got high come on help me now one minute you want to be with your with your wife your girlfriend your husband next minute you don't One minute you think you're all right, you look good, you feel good about yourself, next, next minute you want to jump off a building. Something's wrong. Come on, I, I, I'm being for real. And every, we see this every day. We see it, watch this. This is why the Apostle Paul said there'll be spiritual wickedness in high place. Some of the most unstable folk, you ought to just step back and look at the spiritual wickedness. Because one minute they they smiling and the next minute they talking bad. How in the world can vinegar and honey come out the same place? Can't happen. This is why, back to St. Matthew chapter number 5, this is why I say true Christianity can't can operate out of a conflicting lifestyle. 
What do I mean by that? It cannot live like there is light in you. You cannot live like there is light in you, but speak and associate uh, uh, and, and have an association that is related to darkness. True Christianity cannot operate out of a conflicting lifestyle. I mean, what I mean is that you cannot live like there is light in you, but your speech and your associations are in darkness. Back there, Usher. I'm so I'm so sick. Of, I'm sick of him. I'm just sick of him. Did you ever say who, who are you talking about? Huh? I'm sick of I'm sick of the pastor. He just needs. I, I'm just sick. I'm tired of him. What's wrong with you? Oh, bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Hold on just a second. Time to jeer, brother. Somebody can somebody bring me some Ativan back here. We don't need to take up no offering. We need to do a seance or something. Exorcism. One minute you're talking about folk in the congregation, and then you want to praise God. That ain't going to work. Oh, I'm talking about all of us. I told you I'm talking about everybody tonight. We come to church, but then we go home and we're another way. We one way at church and at home and we go to work and folk like, wait a minute, hold on just a minute. What's wrong with, yeah, I don't know what's wrong with them today. They've been like that for the last four days. I don't know what's wrong with them. Aren't they, aren't they, yeah, yeah, he's supposed to be a pastor, but he's been acting crazy, cussing everybody out, something wrong. Is he on medication? Is he praying? Come on, I'm being, no, no, let's be real. Because see, see, if I'm going to have a pure heart, I cannot function out of light and darkness. Watch this. So therefore, the mind or the inward desire of every Christian must be pure and absent of lust, desire of carnal pleasures, covetousness, or fleshly lust. But our character must be purified by faith and given to God, given to God for the work of the kingdom. So there, this is, and, 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 and I wrote this, this, this is most, this most con, the most conflicting area of Christianity today is in how we view ourselves. That's where the greatest level of con conflict comes. How we view ourselves. How we look at ourselves when we look in the mirror. Remember when I talked about meekness? Remember I said meekness is seeing yourself as you are? Not trying to put on, not trying to put on nothing special or mask. Seeing yourself in every aspect, your weaknesses, your victories, your strengths, seeing the whole you. Living in reality. Yes, sir. Oh. Living in reality. Amen? The Apostle Paul talked, uh, talked about it this way. Let me, let me read this for you. Apostle Paul said it like this. Talking to Timothy. He says, I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went unto Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some of them that they teach no other doctrine. This is where the conflict comes, because we want another doctrine, or we want to teach something that doesn't fit. Neither give heed to fables or endless gener generalities, which minister questions rather than godly edification, which is in faith, so do. Now, verse number five says, now the end of that commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfrayed. In other words, we cannot find, we cannot put ourselves in a place where our heart is not able to function in a pure manner. The commandment is love. That's a great conflict because we don't like to love. 
Amen. Verse number nine. Blessed are the peacemaker. Right? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. It is not simply someone who tries to stop the, fe- the feuding between nations or people. It is a believer that has experienced the peace of God and who brings that peace to his fellow beings. In other words, you just are there. Your presence shifts the atmosphere. Have you ever been in, 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 in a conflict and you just, you just sitting there? And somebody tried to pull you in it. You say, wait a minute. No, we ain't going to go there. And you just, you just soft answer it. And all of a sudden, everything just starts to come down. And they look at you and say, that's why we don't like you. Because <laughs> you're always trying to keep peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. Unique thing about a peacemaker is this. The people that occupy this position are satisfied. Peacemakers are always satisfied. They listen, they they're not they're not gonna they're not gonna get emotional over stuff. They they're gonna they're gonna sit down, they're gonna think it through. And I think I talked about that this morning, talking about uh listening. They listen. Peacemakers are listeners. They don't they, they don't try to interrupt your conversation. My daughter had to teach me that this week. She said, you're not listening to me, so I had to, I had to shut up and listen. I had to shut up and listen. We always think we got the answers. Peacemakers are just waiting for you to calm down so they can speak very softly and minister to that inner person that's struggling. They know how to move in the flow of God's spirit to help people and get in touch with who they are when they don't know nothing about them. Everybody want to have the gifts of the spirit operate. But if you ain't no peacemaker, ain't no gift going to function like that. It's not going to happen. The power of living as a peacemaker. Power of it is, is that uh, uh, people who are living lives of confusion and disarray, uh, peacemakers are stable in their relationship with God. Regardless of what goes on around them, it is hard to move them away from their peace that they get through the Holy Ghost. People will push and push and push and can never move them away. They are those enduring people that always tell you how much they love you when you don't want nobody to tell you. You know how it is sometimes. We, get, we don't want nobody to tell us praise the Lord. We don't want nobody to say glory, hallelujah. We just, we don't want to meet him around us. Oh, yeah. If you've been there, it's okay. Ain't nothing wrong with that. All of us been there. I stay locked up in the room sometime. I ain't had to do that in a long time, praise the Lord. Yeah. You, I'm serious. I, I, I tell, I'll tell the truth. I used to climb under my bed. When it, when it got rough for me, I'd climb under the bed. I would climb underneath the bed. And my wife said, what are you doing? Nothing. Now the bed too low. <laughs> I tried to tell her, I ain't getting under there. I'm claustrophobic, may not be able to get out. And it's heavy too. So uh, I've had to learn to come to grips that I can't control everything. And I, I told y'all Sunday, I can control my praise. I can control my worship, but I can't control everything else. But I can control, control how I approach my day. I can control how I end my day. Amen? Peacemakers know how to talk and seek mutual agreement. They seek a win-win, healing, deliverance, salvation, conversion, and believe miracles take place every day peacemakers it's a miracle when you get your family to have a gathering and nobody fight (laughs) all of them bring the protestant the catholic the muslims all together and they leave peaceful (laughs) jehovah witness even come 
You don't call it Christmas dinner. It's a family dinner. Everybody show up. Y'all ain't hearing me tonight. Peacemakers. They don't seek their own glory. They seek the glory of God. Touch your neighbor and say, be a peacemaker. Peacemakers. Let me read another, uh, another scripture from James real quick for you. And then I'm going to deal with the last two. James chapter 3. Verse number 12 says, can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine, figs, so can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying, strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. The wisdom descended not from above but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure then peaceful, peaceable, gentle, easy to entreat, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Look at your neighbor and say, be a peacemaker. <laughs> be a peacemaker. Stop, stop, stop shooting uh, uh, salt water on Monday and Wednesday and Thursday. And fresh water on, on, on Tuesday and Friday and Sunday. And you hide out on Saturday. Because the reality is where there's envy or bitterness, strife, there's confusion and every evil work. And if you think you have wisdom... That wisdom that they talk about uh, as it pertains to bitterness, envy, and strife it is sensual. That word sensual means it's based on feelings. Your wisdom should never be based on feeling. I'm, 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 I'm going somewhere. Anytime that somebody come to you and say, I feel, tell them so. No, that's all right. Because you feel in it. That's sensual. Sensual is feeling. I, I feel something. You don't want wisdom that, that, that you can feel. You want wisdom that is spiritual. That you see the hard decision makes right paths. Can I give you an example? It's easy to tell somebody off than it is to hold your peace and be made to believe you weak. Wisdom from God will make you look like you weak. But the end of that wisdom is prosperity and promotion. The wisdom that Dr. Hogan will give you get you cussed out and make you cuss. Because it's feeling. We don't live by feeling. We walk by faith. Let me finish. I'm going to close this down tonight. So he said, blessed are they that are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Everybody in here should never want to live their life being persecuted because of something that they did. To be persecuted for righteousness' sake, there is a reward. Oftentimes we think it's because we're being persecuted for God, but sometimes God said, shut up, you opened your mouth. 
God said, go in there, sit down, do your job, do your work. Go in there, don't say anything, but you go in and you got to open up your mouth. And then, it, then guess what? It all break loose. And you done opened up your mouth. Now you ain't got nothing else to say. Because you have fallen into the trap of everybody else. So when he talks about this, causes a person to reach. Uh, when he says being persecuted for righteousness sake, causes a person to reach the highest level of satisfaction of blessedness. This uh, uh, means that people will hunt you down, pursue you, or run you down for their personal gain and your personal embarrassment. When folk looking for you to persecute you, you reach the, you reach the pinnacle, man. Yeah, say, I've been looking for you. I got something to tell you. You ought to know you're doing something. You ain't done nothing. When somebody come knock on your door, yeah, can I talk to you? Yeah, come on in. Why'd you do that? What, what did I do? You did that. Well, that was the right thing to do. You didn't have to tell the truth. You could have told a lie. You could have shut up. No, they asked me a question. I told the truth. Why you come to work? I told you, don't come here with all that. People will hunt you down. Just to go off on you because you living right. Blessed are they when men shall persecute you and say all manner falsely against you. And he says in verse number 12, rejoice. <laughs> or verse number 11, say blessed are them men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner falsely against you for my sake. Verse number 12 is where we're going to close. He says, rejoice, be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted, for so persecuted they, the prophets, which were before you. This state of blessedness begins at the very moment a person believes on Jesus Christ for salvation. This place of satisfaction starts the moment you go down or you believe by faith for God to save. Because when you come to God, you are seeking satisfaction. And when you acknowledge the fact that you need to be baptized, you need to be filled with his spirit, there's a satisfaction that comes over us. And once we have been baptized and filled, there's a satisfaction that we have. But life has a funny way of messing with what satisfies. Are y'all with me? We buy a car. We buy some shoes, buy some clothes. We get something. And then all of a sudden, we're satisfied. And then about 30 days later or six weeks later, six months later, we realize that this ain't really what we want because we allow covetousness and other things to get in the way. So I wrote this. This is demonstrated by the fact that the promises concerning the kingdom of heaven in verses 3 through 10 are in the present tense, not in the past. All of us ought to be living in a present place of satisfaction. And whatever I have, I must become satisfied with. And if I don't hurry up and get satisfied with how blessed I am and who I am and where I'm, what I'm going through and have a hunger for God, I will struggle. While in this life, one may enjoy the results of implementing these truths. The ultimate condition of blessedness will be experienced in heaven. In other words, if I keep living down here like Paul say, whatever state that I am in, be content. My ultimate place of satisfaction is in heaven. This earth cannot satisfy us. The stuff that it produces cannot satisfy us. It can't. If it would, if and if it could, 
we would still have the same car we bought when we first got when, when we first bought our first car. I'd still be driving that 1971 orange Dodge Dart with a bent frame. With a white vinyl top, two doors. I'd still be driving it, Elder Liggins. You'd probably be still driving that, that, that Hudson or whatever you got your first car. I don't know. But we're never satisfied with what's on, on this earth. But we ought to be satisfied that the more we hunger and thirst for God, our heart becomes pure. We become more peaceful. We become more meek. We begin to desire souls more than we desire everything else. Bitterness goes away. We're sorrowful for those who are lost in sin and, and, and sorry that we have done the wrong and damaged people. But our focus is to be merciful to everybody so that in the end, some might be saved. Amen. God bless you tonight. Amen. So we thank the Lord. We're done. We hope that you enjoyed the Bible class. And we hope that you enjoyed that series. Uh, if there are any questions, you certainly can ask them. I will answer them. Uh, not tonight.